Thanks for joining me in this video where we're going to discuss uh, the broad top level nature of a five paragraph essay, the fundamentals of the five paragraph essay. What is its point? What is its goal? And what is its structure? In the next video, we'll dive into some specifics about how to actually execute on that structure in terms of evidence and commentary. But for now, we're staying at the top level. For some of you, this may be a refresher, given that you had experience with the five paragraph essay freshman year or in subsequent years. Um, for some of you, this might be the first time you're hearing this stuff explained this way. Either way, thanks for joining me. The first section I want to talk about today is what I call the God of the essay, the controlling idea. How can I explain this? Well, during youth sports, I was often bewildered at the frequency that otherwise seemingly intelligent adults would jokingly or in a terrifying alternate mode, sometimes seriously, cite the exceedingly silly cliche. Winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. These adults would use this juxtaposition to tell kids to only care about winning, which was strange to begin with for youth sports, which is an activity that has pretty low stakes. But I suppose now I am an adult which gives me the divine right to say stupid things and insist that children view these misguided utterances as nothing short of brilliant. Therefore, I must demand of you that you acknowledge the following truth about the five-paragraph essay. The controlling idea isn't everything. It's the only thing. The essay is not a place to share your ruminations or wander into new conversations or talk about your favorite passages. The essay is not a collection of a bunch of cool ideas you've half thought about. The essay is merely a support system for the controlling idea. Every sentence you write only is good if it helps communicate something that will ultimately help prove the controlling idea. Now this may seem limiting, but it's quite helpful. Think about a seatbelt on a roller coaster. You have to stick in one place but being stationary is much better than the alternative. So all praise to the controlling idea. So what is a controlling idea? AKA, I may reference it later, as a CI. Well, for our purposes, a CI is an argumentative claim about an idea or concept that you're willing to defend is present in a work of literature. It's very tempting to write that sentence differently. A CI is a claim about an idea or concept that you're willing to defend that the author makes in a work of literature. But go with the first one, because we don't really care whether the argument is what the author intended. We care whether there's evidence for it or not. It really has nothing to do with what the author wanted. Let's break down that definition even further. A claim about an idea or concept that you're willing to defend is present in a work of literature. Well... Just to make sure we're on the same page, what are ideas and concepts? I'm sure we can all list nouns that fit that category. Stuff like friendship, love, loyalty, family, uh, perseverance, violence, revenge, scientific progress. We're talking about abstract nouns. Nouns that are not tangible. I.e. they can't be experienced with the five senses. I can't smell scientific progress uh, unless I guess someone leaves a... Bunsen burner on, in which case I'll be smelling danger too. What types of claims do we make about these ideas or concepts in our essays? Well, nothing immensely complicated. We want to start with the easiest top level claim. Are these ideas good or bad? Is this idea worth pursuing according to the evidence in the text? Is it worth avoiding according to the evidence in the text? We call this assessment of whether an idea is good or bad a value judgment. Now, before I move on, I do want to note that obviously not all literary works only set out to make value judgments about ideas and concepts. Some authors merely want to capture what a particular lived experience is like and share that lived experience with other people to build empathy and understanding. And that is super valuable. But when it comes to argumentative writing, it's a bit of a necessary oversimplification we use 
to restrict ourselves to arguing about value judgments about ideas or concepts. So, back to value judgments. If I were to make a value judgment and hope that it compelled you to change, what would be your natural response? So, imagine I walk up to you and I make a value judgment. Hey, you should never eat meat ever again. Would you, without hesitation, cast down your double-double animal style and swear off the polluted ways of the carnivore until time immemorial? Of course not. If you're a combative type, maybe such a command will be met with uh, some rather foul language, but that couldn't be me. Nevertheless, let's say we're friends. I've given up my habit of verbally harassing total strangers at the in and out and now I'm just harassing friends. So when I make a value judgment, yo, you should never eat meat. Your natural impulse, if you're thinking, would be to ask the most powerful question in the English language. Why? Why is that a good idea? And we address this natural tendency towards wanting reasons in our essay writing via what we call subpoints. Subpoints at their strongest are reasons why a value judgment is true. Subpoints are where we develop what I'll call a line of reasoning for the CI. There's a big difference between you shouldn't eat meat and you shouldn't eat meat because it contributes to climate change, is bad for your health, and contributes to the suffering of living beings. P.S. I still eat meat, but you know, for the sake of argument. Anyway, subpoints should always follow the magical word because. If you don't link your subpoints to the CI with because, I'm going to be highly skeptical. Subpoints are not just examples, they're lines of reasoning. And lines of reasoning need the word because to sound natural. Consider the two options. Option one, one shouldn't eat meat as seen through climate change, health, and suffering. And option two, one shouldn't eat meat because meat contributes to climate change, negatively affects one's health, and causes suffering to living beings. Which of these is the stronger and clearer line of reasoning? Obviously, it's option two. Option one has the intention of making the same points, presumably, but because it merely lists examples, it just kind of throws out nouns, it's less clear and effective. Even simple controlling ideas, like an idea being good or bad, become pretty effective when paired with strong reasons. So what type of questions should you ask to generate a strong CI and subpoints? Well, Coming up with a CI and subpoints, the combination of the two makes what we call a thesis. So if I use the word thesis, just know I'm talking about CI and subpoints, can range from pretty easy to very challenging based on the difficulty of the literature you've been assigned. But the questions always remain the same. What ideas and concepts keep appearing in the work? Essentially, ask yourself the question, what is this work about? At the granular level of individual scenes and moments in the work, you should be asking stuff like, what ideas does this moment have a connection to? And trust me, a pattern will emerge, sometimes immediately and sometimes it takes a bit more investigation, but the questions are always the same. Where do you see a pattern of the same idea being talked about in different places? Of course, it's not enough to just say there is a pattern. We need to ask ourselves, what is the nature of that pattern? And this leads us to asking questions to label the idea or concept in the text as productive or harmful. So what type of questions might we ask to make a value judgment? Do characters benefit when they act in coherence with a certain idea or concept? Do they gain success? Do they grow as a person? Do they gain friends? Do they fall in love? Do they conquer a challenge or just have a good time? Or... When characters act in coherence with a certain idea, do they fail at something? Do they stagnate as a person? Do they lose their friends or family? Do they destroy their relationships? Do they not rise to conquer a challenge? Or even, do they suffer injury or death? The better the literary work, the more nuanced and interesting these lines of reasoning will arise when you start asking these questions. So before we move on, I'm just going to put a few examples of theses on the screen to help you visualize what a full thesis will look like. That is a value judgment with three subpoints that give a line of reasoning. Um, Pause the video, take a look at these, 
Notice similarities, notice patterns, and then we'll move on. Okay. Now that we've talked about the god of the essay, the controlling idea and its best friend and sidekick subpoints, I want to talk about structure. How do we build the paper? Well, you may have noticed if you took a look at those examples uh, just a second ago, the Holy Trinity is always present. Three subpoints. Three, magic number. Ensuring you have three distinct subpoints, make sure you have really thought through your value judgment and that you can support it in diverse ways. It's also extremely convenient. The structure of the five paragraph essay isn't changing. It's always gone like this. Intro paragraph, body paragraph one, body paragraph two, body paragraph three, and a conclusion. So if there's three body paragraphs, it's quite convenient to have three subpoints. Okay. We'll talk about intro paragraphs and conclusions later. But obviously, body paragraph one is where you're going to address subpoint one. Body paragraph two is where you address subpoint two. It's simple, it's elegant, it's obvious. Now, to keep this structure even nicer and cleaner, each body paragraph starts with a topic sentence. And the formula for a topic sentence is quite intuitive. It's just the topic sentence equals the CI plus the subpoint one. So let's say we're writing on the following thesis. In Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, Bronte affirms the importance of self-reliance because self-reliance frees one from judgment, develops one's skills and talents, and makes one a desirable partner. Well, then our topic sentence one, we take the CI. In Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, Bronte affirms the importance of self-reliance, and we combine it with a because subpoint one. Because self-reliance frees one from judgment. Now, we have to do a little bit of editing because you can't just use the exact same language, right? Like, no straight copy-pasting. So let's make topic sentence one version two with a little bit different language. In Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, Bronte affirms the importance of trusting oneself because acting independently prevents one from feeling anxiety about others' opinions. It's important to do that language variation, but the fundamental formula is very predictable. It does get a little spicier when we reach topic sentence two and topic sentence three. Now we need what's called a transition, something that bridges the two paragraphs smoothly. There are lazy transition words and they are quite ineffectual. What students will do is they'll just throw next or in addition in front of a topic sentence, which is not an effective transition. An effective transition has to acknowledge the previous subpoint and introduce the next one. So we arrive at the formulas that are on the screen now. Top sentence two needs a transition from subpoint one, ACI, and subpoint two. And topic sentence three needs a transition from subpoint two, a CI, and subpoint three. You can take a look at a color-coded example below. If our thesis is the one from Jane Eyre we were using above, I've put the CI in bold, I've put subpoint one in yellow, subpoint two in green, and subpoint three in blue, and you can see how topic sentence one only has two components, bold and yellow. CI, subpoint one. Topic sentence two has a transition from subpoint one in yellow, the CI in bold, and subpoint two in green. So now we're at three components. Same thing for topic sentence three. Three components. Transition from subpoint two in green, CI in bold, subpoint three in blue. Okay, so this concludes our broad overview of the top level argument concerns and structure of a five paragraph essay. As I indicated at the start of the video, the next thing we'll discuss is how to actually get evidence to prove this point and how to explain your logic in your commentary.